Welcome back to Illiterate TV. I'm Michael Feldstein, and I'm here with George Siemens, the University of Texas at Arlington. George is also the principal investigator on the MOOC Research Initiative. So tell us about the initiative, George. Well, the MOOC Research Initiative was, uh, or is, a research grant funded by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and administered by Athabasca University. And essentially, the need that we're filling with the research initiative is the lack of quality research that is driven from an academic context around what are MOOCs doing to the education system? How are they impacting students? What do students do in the MOOC? What are the costs affiliated with it? What are the design challenges? But that whole raft of research questions around MOOCs. So initially we did an open call which resulted in a large number of submissions. We narrowed that down to a smaller number and then finally we uh, awarded uh, grants to 28 recipients and the grants range from 10 to $25,000. They're short-term grants that run about six months and we want to quickly get research back out into the ed education or the academic landscape so that we can start getting some feedback from other academics. Does this resonate with their experiences with MOOCs? How are things working? Uh, is there some, are there gaps that are there? Because once you have a bit of a baseline of research, people can begin adding to it, responding to it, and uh, extending it into other settings, such as blended learning or MOOC research in a university context. Fantastic. Well, we've had the opportunity to speak to a number of the grantees. There's some really great, exciting projects that we have been hearing about. And so with that, let's hear some from the grantees. So I'm interested in, in understanding how MOOC learners who say they can't afford a formal education are using these MOOCs for economic mobility. So how okay. are people going out and, and finding jobs in our existing cohort of MOOC learners? Uh, our research is looking at how MOOCs are used uh, when they're archived. Okay. So uh, essentially we, we offer these MOOCs, there's sort of this live offering, the start date. Learners progress through the, through the MOOC and then it yeah. ends. And what we notice is that people continue to sign up beyond sure. the end of the course, so. It's impossible for a faculty member to have close communication with, you know, 100,000 students. So a lot of the communication that happens in the course and a lot of the assessment is done peer to peer, student to student. Given the, the, the MOOCs and their success are so reliant on that communication, we want to try to understand it better. So our research team um, consists of collaborators from the Department of Developmental Psychology and they have experience working with uh, qualitative analysis of Facebook posts. Sure. So we're looking at things like the number of posts that people do, the types of posts, what students' goals were in initiating a post, whether that um, post had a response, and if so, what are the characteristics sure. of that response. My research really focuses on studying emergent social behavior in the discussion yeah. uh, forums. What we're trying to do is understand how we might eventually design support for students to find a cohort within the other group of students who are taking the course that can provide support and um, just working together and a sense of, of having some uh, fellow sure. students as they go through the course. How do people regulate their own learning? How do they set their learning goals? How do they achieve those goals? Do they self-reflect? There's a lot of literature on self-regulation. So we're basing our research on that literature and we're mapping what people actually do with what's known in the literature. Our colleagues at University of California, Irvine, created a MOOC called Preparation for Introductory Biology. That's a key gateway course that yeah. really helps determine whether people can stay in the major, get in the major, et cetera. One of the things we're looking at is the role of peer assessment activities within the MOOC and how they contribute to student success as well. We went about creating an effective writing MOOC that's based on uh, parts of speech and language usage. So it is the bottom of our developmental courses and that's what we created. 
people will talk about um, MOOCs as being an opportunity for, for um, people to receive free education and, and an opportunity for those who are low income or, or mm -hmm. uh, unemployed to you know, use these platforms as a, as a pathway um, yeah. for economic mobility. We had a perfect storm in California where we had a problem with economics mm -hmm. tanking and we were trying to increase transfer degrees to the, from our community colleges to our four-year institutions and in the process we were adding courses on that end and reducing courses on the developmental end. This course was for people who maybe had never taken an online course before sure. or who were at the very lowest levels of their education and we were hoping that what would happen is they would take the course and then be able to assess into college level uh, writing and take college classes. So it's for people who are between, in between. Sure. You know, high school maybe in college or, or out of high school and wanting to go into college. This MOOC is, was really designed as a professional development for K-12 instructors. And it's all about uh, discussion facilitation, but really we got a very wide range of students from everywhere from lawyers, doctors, business people. It's a remarkable thing to see students from 195 countries in our classes talking to each other about topics of uh, mutual interest, having very sophisticated conversations, and people spending a lot of time and energy doing it. So if we think about it, people's professional practice is changing, work rules are changing, technologies are supporting this and sometimes even defining it. This is where MOOCs come in. MOOCs are very relevant. Professionals, nowadays, they have to bring in formal and non-formal learning weave them together and achieve their learning goals that will help them with their job. So that means that the learner really has to plan their learning pathway and take control rather than relying so much on the instructor. If you want a, a MOOC that delivers certain things like understanding content, this is the type of pattern you want to have for learning design. But if you want to say it, for a MOOC you're trying to develop certain skills, this might be the pattern you're looking for. It's also for learners as well, what type of MOOC am I going into which type is it? They're not all the same. I think we tend to think of them as kind of MOOCs is one big thing, but they're not. There's, there's lots of different types of things in there. And I think being more explicit about what the kind of contract you're entering into would be important for learners and for, and for designers. How are people uh, learning in, in groups? I mean, MOOCs, is, they're silos. You're, you're learning um, without having the benefit of classmates and that kind of thing. But it's possible that people are learning in, in, in groups or they're meeting offline sure. to, to study these. So I think a year from now, I would, I would like to understand better if that's happening and how is it happening. I hope that we know about how people learn in MOOCs because MOOCs have been designed as, as courses but actually they offer a lot more. You have massive numbers of people. You have the opportunity for those people to, to bring in their own knowledge. It's completely different from the traditional face-to-face -face courses. Therefore the environment design could be very different but we don't really know what to design or how these courses can really change learning until we understand how people learn in the MOOCs. How do MOOCs fit in? Are they going to be more integrated into the, the class? Are there different ways that they can be used in terms of not just higher ed, but also sort of K to 12? Uh, and, and figuring out where MOOCs have a place in this landscape sure. of education. Well, I'm hoping that we can at least at a minimum identify what things that we do centrally as, as instructors or as, as the people who provide the technology that make these things possible. What kinds of things that we're working on do these, these high-performing, uh, influential students um, what really do they find useful? So in terms of program evaluation, that's certainly helpful. How do we address the needs of basic students, of sure. the ones who have trouble in a regular class, who have trouble in traditional online classes and don't do well there? How do we meet the needs of those students? And I think I'd like to learn more about that. And, and I'm also hoping that, that what we know works well in education in terms of people constructing their own knowledge and being interactive and active in their learning, um, that we can look at how that's happening at, in the MOOCs and to what extent. If it isn't happening to the extent that we would like, we can then try to do things to improve that type of interaction 
uh, in the MOOCs. One low-hanging fruit has to do with persistence. Who persists in MOOCs? What kinds of environments help them persist? What kinds of interaction contribute to greater persistence? I think we'll know a lot more about that a year from now than we know right now. We're doing MOOCs because we feel like we have to do MOOCs. We don't know why. I think it's a much more nuanced picture than that. We've been seeing. So if you want to do MOOCs for particular purposes, then this is what you need to do and this might be the return you get on it. And for learners, you know, what do they want to get out of it and what's their experience? I think just trying to build up a richer picture of what it is that, that goes on in the MOOC world and, and where they're useful and also where they don't really apply. At the moment, we're kind of applying them to everything and they kind of, this idea of the, the, the big revolution in higher education. I think, you know, they're not a, a panacea for all problems, and, but they might be really good in particular areas. I think, so finding out a kind of a better detailed picture of, where, of what occurs in the MOOCosphere and it, you know, will be a, a good outcome from now. Right now, there's kind of two endpoints along a spectrum where you can find um, sort of paradigmatic designs for MOOCs. One is the C MOOCs that are very distributed sure. and not very scripted, and then MOOCs that are more like the Coursera MOOCs, where it's extremely scripted and there's sort of a list of things that you do each week. And probably something in between those two is really more ideal for students. How can we build in support so that students' individual needs can be met? We think that, that there can be some a uh, hybrid design somewhere in between those two extremes that would be more conducive to uh, meeting the individual needs of students and, and helping students sure. find the support that they need. And really that's what we're, we're shooting to find. I'm interested really in understanding what kinds of metrics to use to to better understand a success of a MOOC okay. or, or efficacy of a MOOC. So uh, we are interested in correlating some of what we find to student retention and performance in the course, but maybe those aren't the right kinds of sure. correlations to be making. And so I'm hoping that all of the research and aggregate that's happening around MOOCs will help us develop better uh, terminology for these metrics. What the instructors need and what we need in order to be able to persuade more institutions to use MOOCs is some data that shows that yes, community college students who take this course um, and who will go back and take the assessments test again score better or a large percentage of them score better. So that if we could show that, then we could persuade more, again, more institutions around the state to consider offering this to the students and to really promote it. I think at first there was a lot of hype about MOOCs, about it, it's serving all these different populations and perhaps opening a lot of doors. And I think that now, I, what I hope is a more grounded, <laughs> realistic view, Productive which is conversation what, can, what can they be used for? I want to live in a world where people are smart, where they can write, and where they can think, and where they can ask questions um, themselves and not take anybody else's word for anything. And having that global perspective, we watched our students in the discussion forums talk about all kinds of things, some of them never having spoken to people from outside the United States ever before. I suspect it's possible that in some ways uh, this technology uh, could be in fact a Trojan horse that's bringing disruptive forces to bear in the traditional methods of running higher education. And I think that engaging these types of learners is a way for us to understand what's next, in my case in management education, mm. but one could say in higher education in general. So I think it's very important that we move beyond the hype of MOOCs and actually follow these research projects to learn what's actually happening. What did you hear? Well, I heard three different types of, of research initiatives here. I heard uh, researchers who had a specific educational problem that they were trying to solve, like getting remedial students ready for college. I heard researchers that were conducting basic learning research that saw the MOOCs as a laboratory for them to gather more data. And then the third type of researchers are taking a more naturalistic approach, looking at the MOOCs that are happening in the field today and asking, what can we learn from what's going on? But of course, the research is just starting. Over the next six to 12 months, we should be learning quite a bit more. As you look forward, what do you hope that you can learn from the research coming out of this project?